during the Jeep Start Something New sales event, well-qualified returning Grand Cherokee lessees get a low-mileage lease on select 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo E 4x4 models for $199 a month for 24 months for $3,179 to its signing tax title license extra. Call 1-888-925-JEEP for details. Requires due to contribution lease to Chrysler Capital. Currently spussed in by 2-1-2021 on oldest 20% inventory of 2020 Grand Cherokee models and dealer stock for longest as of 1-3-2020. Extra charge for miles over 20,000. Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 2-3-2020. Jeep is a registered trademark. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 61. If it's possible to cut out a word, always cut it out. George Orwell. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is sponsored by Script Haven. Script Haven is an online marketplace for aspiring screenwriters to have a platform to sell their content in a variety of formats, including short form, features, and TV pilots in a simple, fast, and secure way with no barrier to entry. Script Haven also provides a market for producers to purchase or option a huge collection of content posted by famous and not so famous screenwriters from around the world. Script Haven is free to sign up and you can upload as many scripts as you like. And in January, Script Haven is going to be running a screenplay competition for shorts. If you want to sign up, just head over to scripthaven.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Save the Cat. To help develop, tighten, and hustle your story, Save the Cat has launched year two of the Save the Cat Screenplay Challenge and an all-new Save the Cat Story Structure software. The Save the Cat Screenplay Challenge delivers 50 points of analysis for all submissions at no extra cost, and the Save the Cat Story Structure software helps guide your plot, organize, and structure your story. And as part of our new relationship with Save the Cat, we are offering you 15% off both the Screenplay Challenge and the Story Structure software. All you have to do is use the code HUSTLE and get 15% off. Just head over to SaveTheCat.com. Now, guys, today on the show, we have returning champion Carl Iglesias, who's a screenwriter, author, script doctor, and all-around screenwriting guru. And his last episode, which was, I think, episode seven here on the BPS podcast, is one of the most downloaded episodes in the history of the show. So, of course, I had to bring him back at one point or another to dig in deeper to his methods and discuss the essential parts of what all good stories have, the power of adding emotional impact to your writing, and we even talk a little bit about the Joker. (laughs) So without any further ado, guys, please enjoy my conversation with Carl Iglesias. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Carl Iglesias. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, thanks. Pleasure to be here. So uh, you, you have a distinct honor of being one of my very first guest ever on the Indie Film Hustle podcast. You were number episode number eight. Wow. And you were kind enough to give a fledgling podcaster uh, an opportunity to interview you, sir, all those years ago. <laughs> and that interview is done. I mean, I think that that's interviews downloaded tens of thousands of times over the course of the last four years. Uh, it's It's been one of the most popular ones. And we've always like, oh, we got to get you back on the show. We got to get you back on the show. We got to So finally, we like, let's Let's do this. I'm, um, I'm sought after. So, yeah. yeah. I'm glad I finally found the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I appreciate it. It was such a wonderful uh, interview talking about the craft. And I told, yeah. and I, and like I said before, you know, you were one of the first people I reached out to because your book, um, Creating Emotional Impact, was yeah. one of those really pivotal books that I read. It was actually, it was a producer that I was working with on a movie. And they mm-hmm. said, you should read this book after they read my screenplay. They're like, you should read his book. It's probably going to help you. Mm-hmm. And I I was blown away by not yeah. only the emotional impact, but I remember just those little segments. There was a segment in that book that's like, if you have this word in your screenplay too many times, just go in and do a find and replace this word or replace this word. Like this, those like lazy words that you use for writing. It's like when people yeah. read this, it's like those mm-hmm. little things I had just blew my mind when I was right, writing the right. first time. Yeah, because the whole thing was from the readers. Uh, my whole concentration is the reader's emotional experience. So you got to remember that when you're writing a script, your very first audience and only audience will be a reader reading that script. Mm-hmm. 
right? And if they pass on it, that's it. You're done. So you're really writing for one reader. And if you can get, and if you can you make him sure everything, the reading experience, the description, let alone, of course, the craft of storytelling, right? But yeah, just the actual way. experience of reading a script is so important. Well, there, I wanted before I even get into the questions, I, I, I want the audience to understand in regards to writing a screenplay because I've written screenplays, I've written books. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I much rather write books. There's so much more freedom. <laughs> it's easier, isn't it? <laughs> oh my God. It's free. It's, writing seems so easy. Because yet. it's like less words, yeah. right? It's less words. It's less pages. It's like, right. oh, it's easy. You know, my you first book was- a movie. And we go uh, there movies all the time. My first you know? book was like, oh, I think almost 60,000 words. And my second book's almost 60,000 words. Right. And I wrote them like water. It was just like, oh, this is easy. I can, and the first book was, more, it was a narrative story. So it was kind of like, Oh, I could do this. I can do that. There's no economy at all. Where in a screenplay, you have to be so economical. And mm-hmm. I want you just to explain to the audience that when you're reading a page, you need to look out into a sea of white. That is yeah. the goal, is a sea of white. white space. Yeah. As much Less white space. more is, is as, the advice. Yes, yeah, as much as much white yeah. space as you can get. Right. And, you know, yeah. descriptions, how long should descriptions be, all this kind of stuff. So please just explain the whole sea of white. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's obviously, there's also an art to it. There's, the, you know, a lot of uh, producers and development executives that I talk to, they, they, they look for voice, right? It's the voice of the writer. And it's the same with fiction, but with screenwriting, it's, it's even better. So there's, there's a sense of, of wittiness, of, of uh, rhythm, of visuals, imagery, vividness. But the key is uh, the best analogy I found with screenwriting is that it's called it's visual poetry. Right. So, you know, how poetry is very, very uh, a, hi- you know, a, hi- a haiku, like a haiku. Like a haiku. I, exactly. A haiku <laughs> is even is even more intense and, and short. Right. Uh, but uh, but if you think of poetry as opposed to prose, one of the one of the mistakes that I see a lot with beginning writers, screenwriters, is that they write as if they're writing prose. So it's like we call it, it's a very novelistic voice in the script they describe too much when you really, you oh. should think about how to describe the same thing with the least amount of words. So it's really more about poetry and visual poetry than prose. You yeah. Know? Like I've, I've read screenplays where like the man walked into the bar, the bar was, you could smell in the air, the, right, stale, exactly. the stale cigarettes <laughs> as he walked his, the floor right. stuck to the bottom of his shoe. Like that's one. He was prose. thinking about what he had for breakfast. And he was thinking, and then, and, and, and by the way, here's what he had for breakfast. He had, Bacon, <laughs> eggs, but the eggs were runny, yeah, not too right? runny. Like, and, and this the page count is like two hundred pages, right? And that's and that's how it's written. And you're like, I look. Don't get me wrong. I when I wrote my first screenplay, I was not far off from that. It was like it's something I that you have to it learn. Is. It is because when you when you write in school, you know, when you write, even if you're writing, you know, creative writing, it, they don't teach you the economy of of mm-hmm. words and to make right. that impact so much and. And using dashes and and there's like little tricks and techniques to kind of just move things mm-hmm. along and yeah. Uh, but when you read and you'll know by the way, rate page one. You'll know page one, right? Yeah. Page yeah. one, you'll go no. Yeah, <laughs> most executives can tell by page one if if it's going to be a good reading experience or not. Even most readers. And I still remember an anecdote by um, Jerry Bruckheimer, the, the famous mm-hmm. uh, you know parts of the Caribbean producer, who's who's known to pick any script at random and open it anywhere, and he reads one page, and and if he's not wowed by that one page, he throws it off. Wow! So just, that's the challenge, you know. And I do talk about you know in my book when you talk about this when I talk about describing and and writing, it's not just page one that counts. It's not the first ten pages that counts. It's not the first act that counts. It's every single page. And the challenge you should have as a screenwriter is that you should be able to pick any script, open it anywhere, and you should be completely engrossed and engaged by that one page. And if it makes you turn the second page and so on and so on, that's the key. That's the, that's the secret. The thing that I, I feel that screenwriters have been dealing with for years and now even more so than ever is what filmmakers are starting to deal with now in today's marketplace. So before – and also in screenwriting, in the early days, there wasn't a lot of competition. There weren't a lot of people screenwriting. That concept of you could be a screenwriter didn't come in until right. arguably the 70s and the 80s is when it really started to come Actually, up. Actually, right? I may correct you on that. Please that tell me. Up, uh, that goes all the way up to the 1910s. 
When, what do you in mean? 1913, when, like, when, like, there's actually the very first oh, yeah, you're right. thing, yes. how to write a photo play. They used to be called yes, photo Yes, the photo play. play. Yes, 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 there yes. Used to be, there used to be an how-to industry for screenwriters all the way back to 1910. But how much But how much competition? But how much competition? Like, how many people were really... there was books already printed. I guess over, right. that Everybody wanted to write screenplays, right? Then. So it's well, amazing. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And there yeah. was some competition without question. But you're right. In the 70s, I think Sid Field is the one that kind of turned it uh, It blew around. up. It blew and up, so and then it mainstream, yeah, yeah. Linda came out afterwards, and and you know right. the, they they really were the 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 catalyst of like now right. everybody and the technology was a you know much more affordable and it was a big thing, so right. there was a lot less competition back in the days. Now there's an, it's just ridiculous amount of competition for screenwriters. Right. Filmmakers right. before too had less competition in the marketplace. You could if you just made a movie in the eighties, it was sold. Right. Good, right. bad, you know, Toxic Avenger was sold internationally. You know, right. <laughs> it was, it, there was less competition. So I think what we're taught, the reason I'm bringing that up is because w when you're a screenwriter now, you've got to use every trick in the book to cut through all the competition and formatting and, and having that creative white space. I, I'm, I'm assuming you are a genius storyteller. This is beyond the storytelling. That's an assumption. Well, I'll correct you on that one as well. Actually. Sure. Go for it. Tell me, tell me, uh, please. As much as much as there, the, there's an importance in you know the formatting and the description, right? And sure, the way sure, sure. Professional. The number one thing above and beyond anything right. is the craft of storytelling. Well, in obviously, other words, yeah. If if you if you don't know the craft of storytelling, which I find a lot of people don't, they think they do, but they don't. They could have the most perfectly formatted script and the best written description wise. But you're still not going to have a good experience after reading that script, right? Right, right. So it's like there's that joke about, you know, that William Goldman, <clears throat> you know, when he was writing screenplays, he could write – or or Joe Esterhaz, he could oh. write a script in a napkin and it would sell for $3 million, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not about the napkin. It's about the, the craft of storytelling. You know? or, so at least for me, I mean obviously I'm biased because I'm all about the craft of storytelling. Right, which is – Which is an important thing. Which is, without question, I do not disagree with you in the least. But with that said – it, you know, when you're Joe Esterhaus, when you're Shane Black, when you're Tarantino, when you're Aaron Sorkin, you really don't have to deal with any of the rules that we're talking about. You know, because people are going to read it because of, of who you are. But that yeah, first, yeah. but that first script, yeah, that very first one, you can't have misspellings. You right. can't have grammatical issues. You right. can't. Like, you got to feel good. You have you to be tight. You know, first impressions count. You know. You've got I to mean, be I remember tight. when I used to be a reader. That was my first, uh, my first entry level in the industry. Right. I right, used to be right. a, a script reader for Edward James Olmos. And, you know, we have all these tricks. We, can, we look at the, the last page. We go, oh, my God, if it's 200 pages. We know the guy's an amateur. We look at formatting. So there's all these little things that you can do right away to kind of like already get the flags out of the way, right? So you mm -hmm. see all these red flags. You go, okay, that's going to be – that's an amateur. And then you read the script. So you don't want that. So you're right. And those are very fixable. You want to, you know, checking for typos, make sure it's formatted correctly, and all the stuff. Make sure it looks professional. Mm -hmm. That is – that's obviously the first step. Yeah. It's tightening It's tightening up the craft of yeah. just the presentation. Exactly, yeah. With the storytelling involved. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's what you need to cut through all of this competition. Because look at, look, at, look at Bruckheimer. You're like, he'll just grab – I mean how many scripts does Jerry Bruckheimer have yeah. in his office? I'm sure right. piled, literally piled. Piled, all right. Yeah. Piled. Piled yeah. up. So if you're lucky enough, to, like if, if the gods are with you on the day that he picks up yours and goes, <laughs> pirates we call of the, the Caribbean. Pile. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Fighter pilots? No, that's not going to work. You know, so, um, so it's right. so important. So I wanted to, so we, I haven't even asked you the first question yet. So the first question oh is, <laughs> this is going to settle in guys. We're going to be here for a minute. Yeah. Um, so explain to the audience, what is the concept of emotional impact within screenwriting it's something that is 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 basically your bread and butter and your angle on the craft which is when again when i reasons i'd love to have different points of view on the same problem which is the craft of screenwriting right, right. uh well that's a really good question um and and it's funny because i i i, I don't know if i look at it from a point of view of an angle or a niche even though that seems to be my niche because i feel that that's it's, it's needed. everything it's yeah. everything it is the core Right. Of storytelling, right? You mean so, to create emotion? Of no. You mean to, I mean, cre to create emotions I'm in your story? We're talking about the emotions of, a, of the characters, right? No. right? We're talking about the emotions of the audience. We're talking about the emotions of the reader reading your script, right? Mm -hmm. So whether an actor reads your script, they got to be emotionally moved by it. If a director reads your script, 
They have to be impacted by it. A producer needs to be impacted by it. The film needs to impact an audience. It's everything. And not, not only in screenwriting, but in music, in fashion, in everything. It's all, it's like life, right? It, everything is an emotional impact on the reader. And it's what makes you like something or not like something, right? You go to a movie, you say, I like this movie, or it's my favorite movie of all time. The reason it is, is because it was, it emotionally impacted you more than the movie you forgot about that you saw on Netflix or whatever, right? Mm. Um, so, so for some reason, I feel like I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that, you know, everybody kind of talks about it, but not really, right? Well, they, they tend to focus more on, on, on structure and, and plot and characters and all that stuff. So uh, this actually brings up uh, an interesting point about when beginners learn the craft, and they write a script, they usually go in this order. There's three things, right? They, they start with plot. They try to figure out how, you know, how to develop their plot. Then they think of their characters, right? They, they put the characters in their plot. And maybe they're thinking about theme, which is what the whole story is about, right? What are they trying to say with their story? And so plot character theme is like the, the, the process that most writers as they start go through. When you're an intermed, intermediary writer, right, when you know a little more, you have a little more tools and craft under your belt, you start with character, right? So you think of character, then they think about the plot because the characters, what they do and what they want, create the plot. That's smart. And maybe then they think of, of theme. Theme is always the last thing. It's also the least taught uh, subject, but the most important Mm -hmm. And people don't think about this. So theme is something that I've really kind of like dug deep the last, uh, you know, five or six years uh, because it's the most important thing in terms of it's, it's what it's what starts at all in a sense. It's, it's what do you want to say with your story? Now, uh, I remember uh, one of my favorite writers, Rod Serling, who did uh, Twilight Zone, you know, mm -hmm. he's like a yeah, of course. genius screenwriter. And he said, uh Overall theme, so his process was theme number one leads to character, which leads to plot. So the process, and that's the process of most uh, professional writers, right, who, who write great stories, is theme, character, plot, in that order. Not plot, character, and maybe theme, right? So for me, when I see, when I read scripts, when I consult or, or teach, and you know, they, you may have a good plot, you may have some good characters, but a lot of the times we have a breakdown in theme. In other words, they may, some maybe realize that they're trying to say something uh, uh, with their script, but it's not what I call successfully argued through through the script. There's no thematic argument through the script. And so it doesn't work. The sum doesn't work. Even though you may have great characters, great dialogue, maybe a good plot, some twist surprises. Okay, that may work, but there's something missing. And to me, theme is what takes a script from good to great. So it's like, to me, it's the most important thing. It starts with theme, which gives you characters, which gives you plot. But I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. In terms a, of, yeah. So then can you give us an example of a movie that really started with theme, character, and plot? Do you have any ideas? Well, I don't know. Now, most great movies, I don't know how they started. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, right way, yeah, although, yeah, yeah. Although I can probably talk about uh, Little Miss Sunshine because – uh, there is a there is a clip of Michael Arndt, the writer, who's at a bookstore and he talks. He answered a, a, an audience question and he talked about how he came up with the idea for Little Miss Sunshine. And for him, it started with theme. And the the, the, the way he started with theme is because he had, he had heard a quote. Uh, he had heard Arnold Schwarzenegger talk about uh uh, whatever at an interview and Arnold Schwarzenegger said, the thing that I despise most is losers. I don't like losers. Right. So about life is about winners and losers. And he, and he thought that that was such a arrogant, like, yeah. a, a despicable thing to say, right. Yeah. The beings that he had this idea for Little Miss Sunshine. Now, Little Miss Sunshine. So he started with theme because every single thing in Little Miss Sunshine is on point with theme. In other words, this is one of the best. And that's the reason why it's such a simple movie is so loved because it was so thematically rich. It was on point. Everything fits together. The characters, the, what the characters want, their emotions, their arcs, the dialogue, the plot, everything is in service of that theme, right? Which is what's the best way to live? Like is, is winning a sign of success or is it just, you know, being a, a, a human being and 
and loving your family and just enjoying it, right? So the, the grandfather in that movie who says, you know, it's not about winning, it's about trying and enjoying what you're doing, right? Yes. And when you think about it, every scene in the movie fits that, right? Especially the even last simple, one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and even even simple scenes like the diner scene where they're at, with their, their ice cream, it's such a simple scene, but it's like everything about that, about the theme of winnings and losing. And it's everything what the father says, which is all about being a winner and everybody around them is rolling their eyes. Oh, come on. And trying, you know, so when you think about it, a story is really an argument between two sides, right? And you're trying to tell the audience which side is the best way to live. That's what theme does. You know, it's yeah. kind of like a, a how to manual for life when you think about it. Right. Exactly. There was a well, last year's best picture winner, Green Book. You know, yeah. I, I remember watching, you know, I had, a, I had a screener for it and yeah. My wife and I are watching, and we started it late. We started right. it late in the evening. We're like, oh, we'll watch a little while, and then we'll go. And it, right. we we wouldn't turn it off until it hit like midnight, and we were like, we got to keep watching right. this. Right. And and the, and the, what I well, that's the emotional impact for you. That, well, there's no, is, there's, it, it moved you, it engaged you. You wanted to see the end of it, no matter how no, late it was. Exactly. That's, right. If it's and, scripted and that, you're good. Right. And the thing that I found so amazing about that movie, which. It's not a movie that I'm going to watch a thousand times. It's just not one of those films. Like Star Wars is one of those films, or you know, you know, for me, Shawshank Redemption. Well, Star Wars everybody. is great thematically. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And, so, and Shawshank Redemption, which is uh, everybody right. in the show knows my my love for that film. But there's there's films that I'll watch a thousand times. But that movie, uh, the theme of it, and I, it was just two guys in a car essentially. The entire movie was two guys in a car. You know, <laughs> for the most part of it, it was just like right. the banter between these amazing actors. The right, dialogue right. was remarkable. Right. The, and, and you're just sitting and there. If I said, what was the movie about for you? Like if you say, what was the movie about? It's about friendship. It's about friendship. Yeah, there you go. It's about friendship. It's about yeah. it's about the battle of of, of societal and, norms. Well, yeah, friendship overcoming racism. Yeah, yeah, friendship overcoming that's, societal that's the that the driver takes, right? Right, societal yeah. norms, and then on both sides, on both yeah. sides, because he was yeah. he was an elitist. Um, the 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 um, uh, I forgot his name. His, his he won the best a- actor. I forgot. There's a uh, Vigo Morgison and the other guy. The other guy All was right. an elitist because he was a very well educated man, and Vigo right. was and, a street and, thug and alone and disconnected completely. While this right. guy was ignorant, a street thug, right, but right. had a heart of gold. Exactly. And he had a moral compass. Yeah. And as rough and as it was just, but it was so simple. It was so yes. like a good meal, a, yeah. a well executed yes, meal. Right. That's not that's complex. That's another of my kind of maxims that I always tell students and, and clients, which is like always aim for a simple story with complex characters, not the other way around. Right. A lot of people think of complex stories with twists and surprise and all stuff. And then they come up with simple characters, which is not good. Right. So think, Simple stories, complex characters. Without question, man. Now, yeah. what? Now, what are some key elements that you need for a very impactful scene? Which are the scenes are the building blocks of our right, of our right. story in in this right. in this platform? Well, that's another. That's a big topic. So, scenes is something that I find that a lot of writers don't know how to do, even though they think they do. Right. So they think of. Uh, you know, they, they think of a scene with two people talking and what they mostly do is basically uh, it's just exposition, right? They're talking about what they need to the audience needs to know for to advance the, the story. And so you have two people. Basically, most of their dialogue is exposition. So uh, the first thing that I tell people about scene writing is look at it as a mini story. Right. So if you think of a story, you think about three acts. Right. You think of a beginning, middle and end. You think of a character who wants something. Right. You think of conflict, what's standing in their way and what do they do about it. Right. That's your whole script. Well, think about the same thing in a scene. In a good scene, you have a character who wants something is having difficulty getting it. Right. And you you watch how they get how they go about getting it. And sometimes they get it. Sometimes they don't. And then you move on to the next scene. Right. So that's why I call it dramatic scene. So dramatic, not in the sense of, you know, melodramatic, like, you know, hysteric people yelling at each other. I'm talking about dramatic in the true sense of the meaning of drama, which is a character not getting what they want. That is the essence of drama. Uh, and then right? that's so also a, a, a want something and not getting it. Right. And if you do scene, if you if you're able to construct scenes like that, you keep the audience engaged the entire Absolutely, time. Because that creates tension. They wonder if they're going to get it or not. Right. And especially if you have stakes, which is another part of the equation. Right. High stakes, low stakes. It's got to be important for the character to get in the scene. So if we don't care 
uh, we're not going to care, right? So it's got it's kind of you got to have high stakes in the scene, right? A, a strong reason for a character wanting something and a desperation for them to get it, uh, and and then we you have tension. And to me, tension is this kind of interplay between you know us worrying that they're not going to get it or something bad's going to happen and hope that things are going to work out for that character. So a scene like um, in a Hitchcock movie, Hitchcock, the, the bomb underneath the desk, uh, the bomb underneath yeah. the, ta- the, the the coffee table, right. Right. that right. whole concept of, um, you know, wh- where, because that, that scene to me, and there's a lot of Hitchcock, Hitchcock, right. ar- arguably he was very, there were characters and some of his best movies were character driven, like Psycho, right. North by Northwest. Oh, right. Some of his other ones were much more structural in plot. Well, he was the master of suspense. He, right. All he cared about, right. he, all he cared about was suspense. That's all he cared about. That's he cared it. about great tension. He really cared about right. manipulating the audience's emotions. Right. 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 And he even said that is actually a, a, a great anecdote uh, that was shared by Ernest Lehman, who wrote um, North by Northwest. And he said that you remember when he used to be on set in between takes and Hitchcock said, you know, uh, it's amazing how how the movies, you know, we do this and the audience feels this and then we do this and the audience feels that. It's almost like we're playing an organ at a church and, and each key is a specific emotion. And uh, and then Hitchcock said, "Yeah, pre- pretty soon we won't need uh, we won't need that. We won't need the uh, movies anymore. We'll just kind of like uh, put him to electrodes or something like that, and and you know play play all the different keys." But he was a master at that. Uh, and that example about the bomb on the table was really to explain the difference between surprise mm-hmm. and. Uh, dramatic irony. So dramatic mm-hmm. irony is also known as reader superior position or audience superior position, which is putting the audience in a superior position than the characters. Meaning that they know that, something that nobody else. They know that the characters you they know something the characters don't know. So his his take, which he was right about, is that you could have two characters talking in a scene at a restaurant talking about the weather, right? And suddenly the a bomb goes off because it was a bomb on the table. We didn't know this, right? So you have five seconds of shock and surprise, okay? Another way of doing that scene is to actually have the two people talking in the scene and then put the camera down so you see the bomb ticking and it's got 15 minutes to go and then you go back again to their, to the people talking about the weather. Now you have 15 minutes of tension and mm-hmm. suspense. Mm-hmm. So he said, yeah, f- 15 minutes of suspense is a lot better than five seconds of surprise and shock, Yeah. right? All right. So, uh, so audience superior position is a, is probably one of the most often used techniques, very effective uh, for creating that engagement and creating that suspense and that tension. And know? then uh, the the concepts that you were just talking about before, where an, uh, where a character in a scene needs to uh, get something and something stopping them, that conversation at that table right. could be all of that. But then right. you add into the mix, there's a bomb underneath the table. Right. Right. And but the Hitchcock said one very important thing that you left out that you cannot once the audience knows the bomb is there you cannot blow the table up. You can't blow the place up because they will be <laughs> very upset with you. If you kill right. them and they didn't know about it, okay. But if you right. let them in on it and you torture them for 15 minutes and you still right. kill them, they'll never forgive you. Uh, I know exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. So um so can, now you also have gone deep into Pixar. And the magic of what Pixar has able been able to Only do because they're the master storytellers. I it's mean, like they are. It is my favorite stories of all time. Are Pixar? I'm a big fan of Pixar. I study their techniques, and they all fit with what I'm talking about. So it's so, and it's so fa- it's it's so fascinating their process with the the yeah. creative like kind of round table or the mind the mind uh, what is it? Oh, uh, the brain trust. Yes. Brain trust. Yeah. yeah. So the brain yeah. trust where they have like you know seven amazing storytellers that like literally right. rip apart stories and they put it together and Pixar, you know, they haven't hit it out of the park every time they have a hell of a good batting average, but they right. haven't, you know, there's cars too, but, um, <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but, but there's also, you know, up, you know, there, yeah. you know, and there's so many amazing stories and they, they, let's say there's like an eight out of 10, nine out of 10 for Pixar without question. Yeah, they still know how to tell a good story. They did. They still don't know how to tell a good story. Yeah. What, um, what do they do? What is it about them that that makes them able to pull those emotions? Because like I, I just watched Toy Story four, 
And yeah, I'm with my daughter, okay. and I was just like at the. I'm like, what? This is a, what? Why? Like, I don't understand. Like, I mean, Pixar. I'm a grown ass man, and I'm like crying at a cartoon. Certainly, they, they do make you cry. That's for I sure. mean, t- Toy Story three, <laughs> Toy Story two. That song in Toy Story Wall-E two. And, oh no, uh, Wally! Don't even get me started. Emo. Oh yeah, no. No, you 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 listen to that sad song that uh, what's her name the the cow the cowgirl song is. Oh, singing that was in, in Toy Story two. two. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah, so, yeah. the song the sad. Oh. song about the toy and about she goes yeah. about, it's a three minutes and you're just like oh, oh. yeah <laughs> or the first or the first five minutes of up <laughs> right. the most the most amazing way to tell right. a story of an entire life's right. love you're just like yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How they do it. So they're, so they're very good at that. But again, you gotta, you gotta understand too. It's not just about that, right? I mean, they, they, they don't, they don't take you to the movie and then show you just a, a sad scene and no. you cry and you go home. That's not no, it, no. right. No, no, it's no. It's a whole complete experience. So that's the good thing about, about, uh, about Pixar is that because they're, they write, they write for everybody. They write for kids. They write for adults, right? Every, they got, the four demographics, right? The four Q, we call it, right? Mm-hmm. Young, old, men, women. But they tell what I, what I call a complete story, right? A complete story has got characters we care about, uh, a, a, a good story, right? A thematic argument, right? So all of them are about something important, uh, character transformation. Uh, this has got some funny scenes. It's got some sad scenes. It's got some tense scenes, right? It, it, it runs the gamut of emotions. So... You know, I talk about emotional impact, but a lot of people think, well, I'm talking about the character emotions. It's not a character emotion. It's about the audience emotions. So when you think about the emotions you like to go and pay money for, you go to the theater or watch TV or watch Netflix to feel these emotions. So the emotions that you want to feel is laughter, right? If you want to watch a comedy, you want to feel romance. You want to feel love. You want to feel connection between human beings. You want to feel anticipation. You want to feel hope. You want to feel curiosity. You want to feel surprise. You want to feel tension. We like tension because this engages us, right? It create, it keeps our brain locked in, right? So all these emotions is what I'm talking about in the book and in my classes about how do you do that? How do you create curiosity? How do you create anticipation? How do you create suspense, right? There's actually techniques, which is what the craft is about, right? So you can teach the techniques. I can't teach people what to write. I can't tell you what ideas to write or what story to write or what characters to write, but I can tell you when something does not work. If I read a script and I'm not engaged by it, I'm I'm bored with it, I don't care, I'm gonna tell you why I don't care and I'm gonna show you how to fix that because that's what I focus on. That's my specialty in terms of like the actual emotions of the reader and of the audience. They, you know? they, they, they have, I mean, obviously they have an amazing batting average and, and the stories that mm-hmm. they continues to tell again and again, you just sit there they going, do it great. Yeah. How, the, how, do, how do you do it? And it's, and it is one good thing about them. If anyone listening is writing stories for kids, yeah. you've got to throw those inside jokes for the adults. Cause that's right. what's, <laughs> that's, what's going to make it better. And, you know, it, 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 it goes away from that. Yeah. There's a difference between Saturday morning. I know I'm aging, dating myself, but Saturday morning cartoons, right. which are dedicated directly to f- kids and mm-hmm. then a Pixar movie, which right. an adult would watch again and again right. and again and again. All right. Like, up. Then look, at, look at cartoons. Like my favorite cartoons, Luntun cartoons was the, the uh, Roadrunner uh, cartoons, right? With Wally, Wally yeah. Coyote, my favorite character. Oh. And those, I mean, adults enjoyed those as but the, well. But those are di- about, you know. But that was there's some uh, conflict. Okay, so yeah, let's okay, let's break this down. You brought this up. Let's break down the Roadrunner and Wally Coyote and why they endure to this day. And they also there's no language, so it, every every language in the world can get it. Yeah. Every every culture in the world pretty much it's got everything in it. So ex- so about it. and we're yeah. talking about simplicity. So let's let's yeah. let's break it down. Okay, well you got a character. Right. Who wants something and, and, and who wants something desperately. <laughs> yes, right? he does. And what does he do about it? He's the most creative person in the world because he comes up with all these different ways. And we appreciate that. We go, oh, that's very clever. Right. And then we hope because he's been doing it, because believe it or not, we care about Wally Coyote. Right. Uh, we can also care about the bird, but the bird just keeps uh, running away, right? The uh, bird is actually smart. There's no him. emotion. There's no. We there's no. The bird as well. I would we argue root for, we root for coyote. There's no right? emotional connection to the roadrunner. There's emotional connection to the plight, the plight of the of the coyote. Exactly. Right, because we understand, right? And and the thing with Wally Coyote is that it's the epitome of perseverance. 
the epitome of perseverance. And we all, that's the thematic argument, right? In all those cartoons, they talk about perseverance, how to be, per, how to persevere, how to keep going, how to come up with new ideas. Even if you fail, it's not about failing. Right. It's about failing and getting up and try again a different way. And that is a life lesson if I didn't hear one, you know? That's and what it, we love so much. Plus, and, it's funny, you know. And, and we, it, see how, we want to see how the 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 coyote just keeps failing all the time. And I've yeah. only seen a couple. If I remember, he only caught the the Roadrunner like two or three, four times. I think in the you entire know, I, road. Oh my God, this reminds me. There's actually a clip online. You could, you could Google it. I think it was. Uh, oh, I don't know if it was uh, Seth MacFarlane or something. So like the Family Guy guy. Yeah. yeah. And I, he did a, a a small a cartoon of what happened the day that. Wally Coyote actually killed the Roadrunner and his life afterwards. <laughs> it was so funny. It's only four minutes long and it's hilarious because it's like you get this guy, the coyote is like so depressed because he has nothing to look forward to and he's drinking and he's like, he has, not, he has no goals, you know? <laughs> and and, 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 and the, it, I know we're laughing, but that is actually what happens in our business all the time. You you see these people who win Oscars or have a, a $200 million big, huge movie. And once they get to that success- they get to the top, there's nothing else after there's, that. Yeah. Like they, they crash and their entire world comes crashing down around mm -hmm. them. Uh, yeah. People who win the lottery, you see that happen all yeah. the time. Exactly. Um, but I am going to look up the Which Wiley shows Coyote. You, and by the way, this is uh, one thing you have to understand about stories is that there's a reason why we love stories. There's a reason why stories are shaped the way they are in terms of characters with goals and transformation because it is it, we evolved with stories and stories kind of teach us how to live, right? So this is like we're talking about the the, the Roadrunner. That's a lesson in perseverance and not giving up, right? That's something that they teach us in life as well. So it, it, mm -hmm. it, it matches. And so when I, when I talk to writers about storytelling and theme specifically, because theme addresses that, is you've got to make sure that what your story addresses is life, you know, like all the, the problems with life. So in terms of like perseverance or love, right? I mean, there's a reason why love stories are the most popular and romance, romances. Um, you know, uh, relationship stories. Um, yeah, no, of course, of course. And it was just, it was those stories that kept us alive because the, you would tell the story about the tiger at the, at the, at right, the end exactly. of the river that yeah, killed yeah, the boy. Yeah. And all of a sudden that story would go like there was a tiger that killed by the river and that story kept going and kept the tribe safe. Exactly. And, right. and those stories the around the stories are our survival mechanism is what made us evolve and survive up to now and right. for a long time. Yeah. There's never yeah. been a, there's never been a culture without stories. Like every yeah. culture in, in the entire civilization from the very beginning has had stories. From the moment we're able to communicate with each other, we've had stories. And I think you it's know? also just another way for us to share our life experience so we can feel that we're going with it through it with somebody else. Exactly. Exactly. It's, like, yeah, like, yeah. it's cathartic. I bring up another very interesting point. Have you, you heard of uh, mirror neurons? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of yeah. them. So the whole the, the reason we so connect to movies and to you know is all about this this concept of mirror neurons, which is we have we have neurons in our brain that that when we watch something, the brain thinks that we are doing it. And so when we when we see a character doing something on screen, your brain is thinking the same thing that you're doing it on screen. And so that's there's that connection, right? So you see things that look like life, and you see characters doing things and transforming, right? That in a subtle way teaches you how to do it in a, in a, in a subtle way. Yeah. Is, is that why the Joker has gotten such a visceral reaction from the public? Because it, oh, it, there's okay. a lot of people who walk out. I was in the theater when I was watching and there was people walking out. I've actually they, haven't seen it yet. So. It's, I, won't, I won't ruin it for you, but it yeah. is – but you you understand the concept. I heard it's, it's the really joke. good. Right? It's, it's I I loved it. I thought it was a, yeah. I thought it was a masterpiece. I think I think um, Joaquin Phoenix will yeah. win the Oscar. I mean, if he doesn't, it's a it's an absolute travesty if he doesn't win the Oscar. Right. Yeah. But but I was fascinated. I walked in with you know to get me to go to the movie theaters nowadays with a family and everything is rough <laughs> and to get me right. and my wife to go and spend the money right. on a baby like it was it, like you know you know you know it's really hit the mainstream when my wife turned to me and goes have you heard about what's going on with the joker and i'm like how do you know about she's like it's everywhere we got to go see this Everybody, movie yeah. Yeah. So, but it was fascinating to watch a character, and the same thing happened to Taxi Driver. That's why Taxi Driver is because it was obviously mm -hmm. the Joker is Taxi Driver, pretty much right. in, in many right. ways. But Taxi Driver rubs people the wrong way because you're going on a journey with Travis Brickle, and you're feeling 
what it's like to be in, insane. Right, essentially, right. right? And not mm-hmm. the one flew yeah. over the cuckoo's nest insane, which was fun. Right. Like uh, this kind of insane. And I think that's why I think, I mean, viscerally people are reacting so interestingly to Joker. It's just yeah. an interesting thing in today's world. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it when I, when I have a minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it is. Yeah, it's definitely my number one uh, movie on my list to, to see. Yeah. But man, but those mirror neurons is, is something very, very, very powerful. Um it, you you feel for what the character is going through. Exactly right. It's the whole the whole thing of empathy, right? It's like, a, and that's the thing. Whenever, no matter if the character is is good or evil or immoral or moral or a good person or bad person, the fact that you know he's the main character, and there's also actually techniques and and and, sure. and tricks to make you connect with, to make you care, right? So it's important to make you care because you can care about a character or you can not care about a character. If you don't care about a character, it doesn't matter what they do, your script is done. So you got to learn how to care about the character. And so I bet you, even, even though I haven't seen the movie yet, I bet you that that the filmmakers take the time to make you care about mm-hmm. Joaquin Phoenix's character before you see him do what he does, right? Which I'm assuming is negative. Um, and you kind of root for root for him, right? Because you care. But and that's where I think the problem lies was that you're rooting for a crazy man. You're rooting right. for a murderer, and it's like look like Sil- at least with Silence of the Lambs, we lo- I love Hannibal Lecter. We, like Hannibal Lecter is such a charming. He right, eats right, people. Right. He's he a eats, cannibal. <laughs> he eats people, but right. yet, but then we ha- but we had Jodie Foster as right. the. But then later in the other movies like Hannibal and things like that, he well, became the main thing. character. Here's the thing, though. They may he may eat people, right? But they were bad but he people. only eats the people that well, uh, maybe not that he did that deserve it, right? The way the, the the film ends, you know, we feel this poetic justice of him eating Dr. Chilton at the end, and it's the same with shows like Dexter, for example, right? Like Dexter is a serial killer, but he kills the wrong people. He kills the people who deserve it, and so that makes us feel good. So and that. Like- Gelanti. And that's and that's the thing that you're exactly right. Like anytime you, you know the, the quickest way for you to hate somebody on a screen, it's one of those old tricks. Like kick, have the villain kick the dog, like okay. the, or even kill the dog. Yeah, you kill yeah. the dog, kill you, eat the dog, whatever that, you want to do. I've heard uh, Stephen King once say that uh, of all the the hate letters he got was when he actually killed a dog in one of his novels. Like he could do it. He could kill people in the most amazing ways, but if he kills a dog, he's going to get the hate crowd. <laughs> you know? Right. And that's like the you easiest way. It's yes. the easiest way for you to, to hate somebody right and, away is have them hurt an animal, hurt a kid. And that's not really the, and it's not the only thing. There's a whole bunch no, of stuff. There's a, when, when I read scripts, uh, clients and I say, and I, I'm very aware of, what connects us and what disconnects us. So there's going to be times in this, in the script where I go, okay, you know, this, what he did or said there is a disconnector. It disconnects us. So do you want to keep it there? Is there a reason why you want it or is it accidental? Because a lot of times the writers don't know what they're doing, right? They're just writing the script and they, they don't realize that they just disconnected the audience from the character and they don't know why. They don't know why the scene's not working. They don't know why the script's not working. And I could tell them, well, you just disconnected us here. It was intentional, but the, we, we don't know, don't care about the character. So everything that happens after that, if we don't care about the character, you're done. You know? So what are some of those elements and techniques that help you create a character that you have strong emotional ties to? Because that is also agreed. I mean, I watched, I was watching a show the other day, and it was just like, ugh, like I just like the plot was right, oh, the plot was care. plot was good, but I'm like, uh, if I get up and go to the bathroom and I tell my wife, just keep playing it, it's fine. You don't have to pause it. I'm I'm disconnected. Right. But then you watch other shows or you watch other movies and you're just like or, or no, no. think about the classics, right? Think about the classic uh, uh, sitcoms, right? Like Friends or you know, the Seinfeld, office, right? yeah, office. Or right. Seinfeld, right? They're classics or cheers. I, I mean, because you care about the characters, right? It's like you want you don't care even even if the jokes are not funny or you know, I mean they are, but it, even if they weren't, you would still want to be with those characters. You just wanna be in the same room with them. And that's why you keep tuning in. Week after week after week, you know. So, what are some of those uh, elements that create those that emotional so, tie? So, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, right? I have a whole chapters in, mm-hmm. in my book, but, um, but in terms of connecting emotionally, right? So, there's these three things that I talk about, and you can see that very well with Pixar as well. Uh, so, when I teach my classes on that, I show the the, the Pixar clips uh, and show you how it's done, and then show you the people that don't do it, right? Um, so there's so there's a uh, element of what I call pity, humanity, and admiration. Right. So there's uh, if you can create pity in the character, meaning we care about something that happens to them. Right. So something happens and it could be any character. You, you meet any character. You don't know anything about them. And if something 
happens to them that is that makes you feel sorry for them like let's say they're they're bullied by someone or they just got robbed or they 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 lost their wife or they just lost their dog or whatever whatever it is anything that em- makes us empathize and we feel sorry and there's hundreds of those right so empathy and pity is one of them right you cannot you because of the way we're built as humans we cannot not care if you feel pity for someone and it could be a villain as well that's what they do with Hannibal Lecter right the fact that Dr Chil- Chilton abuses uh uh, Anthony Hannibal, Hopkins. Yeah. We feel we feel sorry for him, even though he's a Hannib- he's a cannibal, right? <laughs> right? So so pity is one of them. Humanity is very important, and that basically is show the character the character's humanity in a sense. Make them make them care about something other than themselves. So mm-hmm. a character who's not selfish. So a character who cares about something, whether it, they care for a dog, they care for a pet, they care for a plant. They do this in the Leon the Professional. Uh, you, you read my mind. It was, yes, exactly, yeah, right? Because yeah. that's very well so, done. He, it was so beautiful. He's a killer, oh. right? He's a hitman. He's but hitman. we care for him because when we go home, he drinks milk and he, and he takes care for his plan. We know, oh, he's a good guy. <laughs> you know? He just happens to kill bad he's, guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, so that's one of them. So show humanity. Show that you care about something, uh, a cause. You, you have a friend you care for. You care for your parent who's sick. I mean, all this stuff, right? Uh, you chuck somebody in bed, you bring him soup. There's there's thousands of those. So humanity is a second one. And then the third one is the one that most people know about is admiration, meaning that you give the character traits that we all admire in a human being. So think about like in your dating days, you had a list of the admir- admirable traits, admirable traits you wanted in your mate because that's what most people admire. So somebody who's beautiful or handsome, somebody who's smart, somebody who's funny, somebody who's the best at what they do, right? So the best cop, the best agent, the best soldier, the best whatever, right? Best surgeon. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Somebody who's courageous as opposed to Indiana, you know, like Indiana Jones, brave. So yeah. The list, the list of positive traits that are admirable in a person. So when you combine those, those three, and it's funny because talking about Pixar again, <clears throat> I showed the clip in Wally where we, where we meet in the beginning, we meet Wally and he's doing the garbage thing, but there's the scene where he finally goes to his house, to his little home. And it's only a three minute, a three minute scene. But in those three minutes, you get about 20 plus little tips of all this stuff that I talked about. Right. And those 20 things are kind of like designed to make us care about that character. And he's a robot. He's a he's a garbage cleaner. Right. But yet you see you, you feel sorry for him. You, you see his humanity. You see that he cares about things. He, they're showing us how human he is. Right. And there's a lot of ad- admirable traits in there about all the little things of how he keeps his house and he collects things and he likes romantic movies and and he sings to himself. I mean, there's all these little things that just add up. Those are called the little touches, character touches. And that's what you want in, you know, in, in all your characters. You know? Yeah, it's it, yeah. I was thinking about that movie. Like, there's no dialogue. There's yeah, barely think, any dialogue in that movie. Yeah, it's, it's my like my, one of my old top five favorite movies of all time. That it's, with Up and uh, uh, Finding Nemo, uh, The Incredibles, Toy Story, Toy Story Two, Toy Story Three, Toy Story Four. All, I mean, all four of them. It's amazing, right? All four of them are actually really are, good. Yeah, they yeah. they always hit it out of the park with the Toy Stories, yeah, yeah. without question. Now, <laughs> I, there's another thing that I think a lot of screenwriters have a problem with uh, is the dreaded dialogue and mm. being able to write realistic and sharp dialogue. And yeah. and and so one. I want any any help you can give us to help dialogue sure. in the world would be for, for, right. but also to talk on the nose dialogue which I when I wrote my first few screenplays was horrible it was I was just <laughs> I would get that note back constantly be like dialogues on the nose and I'm like what does this on the nose mean like I don't understand what it, I didn't even I was so ignorant to the process I didn't even know what under right, right. so please explain on the on, on the nose dialogue and then how to avoid on the nose dialogue right right. Well, I'll take you your first question because uh, I had a funny <laughs> remark for that when you said, how do, how do we become good dialogue writers? And I was going to say, well, there's a, there's a very simple process, but it might, it might require a little bit of surgery, which is go and take Aaron Sorkin's brain and put it inside your skull and then you'll be a yeah. good dialogue writer. Or, or, David Matt. or Tarantino. Yeah, exactly. Or Tarantino, <laughs> exactly right? So, uh, but all joking aside, uh, the craft of dialogue is probably the most important thing. I'm not, I mean, I've done theme and scenes and craft of it, whatever, right? So I like this analogy that uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, uh, shared with writers where he said that a great story is architecture, not interior design, 
right? So architecture of a story is the structure, the theme, the plot, the characters. It's the foundation of a good story, right? So it's a solid story. Dialogue is interior design, mm -hmm. right? So it's like it's all the little color of your walls and your posters and I'm looking at your room, right? There's a very specific interior design going on, right? <laughs> that would dialogue be. So you could have a solid house that, that is standing on its own, but if the room has no good interior design, it's still going to look kind of yucky, right? You're not going to have a good feeling about it, right? If your room was empty. So so that's what dialogue is. So you could have a that's really great. good script, but with terrible dialogue, it's still not going to create that emotional impact you want in the reader, right? Okay. And by the way, it doesn't mean you're not going to sell your script. It just means they're going to hire a, script, a rewriter to do the script. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but in Hollywood, dialogue writers are hired at six figures for a couple of weeks' work just to punch up the dialogue because that's how important it is, right? So, so, so can I stop you for a second? Because I want, I want to make this really clear for people because this is a wonderful analogy. If you yeah. have the most beautiful home designed yeah. mansion, but the yeah. interior design is tacky and bad. Yes. The value of the entire house goes down. Yes. And it's that simple. That, and I think that it's a right. great, great analogy for screenwriting. Right. I've never heard that before. I think it's so, mm -hmm. so important because it is, the house is the foundation with the, the, yeah. the theme, the structure, yeah. the characters, but right. that dialogue is the painting. Yeah. How, what color is it painted? Is it right, is it right. neon? Is it neon design. green paint? And, and <laughs> you know, I, I I mention that every single time with clients and students because when I give feedback and something is not working at the foundation level, right? I say, okay, you know, thematically or character or story, something is not working. And they come back to me and say, oh, but what about that little scene where this character says this and that? That's it's like, a nice painting. Line? And I'm going, yes, it is, but I don't care. I just don't care. You're talking about your house is crumbling and you're talking about what poster to put in your wall. I mean, come on, right? That, that's so, exactly it. So that's a great analogy. I love that analogy. Thank you, know, thank you Ernest Hemingway. Uh, <laughs> but but that's, that's the thing. And so writers sometimes do not understand that the foundation has to be solved before they think about the interior design. So... Uh, but dialogue is one of, is the interior design and and uh, on the nose dialogue to come back to your question is probably one of the biggest challenges uh, with writers because there's there's different levels of dialogue right so there's dialogue and I break it down into these four categories in in my book which is emotional impact which is the lines that that make you smile, that make you laugh, witty lines, sarcasm, all this stuff. They, they create an instant reaction, right? So they, they like, ooh, that was a great line, right? That's em emotional impact. Then you have character, which is character voice, which is what, the, what the, the character says and the way they say it reveals their personality, reveals their opinions, their, the, their traits, et cetera, et cetera. So those are character, that's what we call individuality for dialogue. The third one is exposition. And unfortunately, most writers tend to focus on exposition. And that's where you get the on the nose uh, uh, claim, right? Feedback. Because exposition is characters saying information that you feel the audience needs to know to figure out what's going on in the scene or in the story. Unfortunately, that's all they do, right? So all another feedback you get with dialogue is that all the dialogue sounds the same. All the characters sound the same because it's really just your voice and all you care about is giving exposition. So you don't care about character, you don't care about emotional impact. The opposite of on the nose is subtext and that's the fourth category and that's probably the hardest thing to master. It's usually where you get to the professional level and you're a master of dialogue, that's when you get subtext. And, that, and that's when the, the line of dialogue kind of implies things. You don't state it on the nose. On the nose means you're stating exactly what the character is thinking and what he's feeling, right? So um, I'll give you an example, top of, top of my head. If, if you're a, a friend of yours, you know, who you don't really like comes to visit you, right? And, and, and you say, uh, oh, it's you, right? In, in effort, right? We, we understand that's subtext for, I don't like you, right? But if he says, now, oh, it's you, it's all about no, performance. <laughs> well, no, but no, they, so that would be, uh, right. So that would be like the subtext, right? Or so you, you know what he's thinking, you know what he's feeling without saying it. Now, a beginner writer who's gonna write on the nose dialogue would be, oh, I'm really unhappy to see you right now, right? That's 
you're stating exactly what he's feeling. That's on the nose dialogue. Right? So you, you I'm mean really, I'm not happy right now or so, I'm so happy to see you. That's on the nose. So so you mean basically uh, the room, basically Tommy Wiseau's The Room is basically the entire movie is on the <laughs> nose, on, on the nose dialogue, <laughs> which makes it so beautiful and wonderful of that movie. I absolutely it's exactly. one of my it's so bad that it's good. It's yeah. one of my favorite movies of all time purely because it's so bad. And right. when you said that, I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. That's like, oh hi Tommy, I just walked in the door. Thank you. How yeah, was your day? Exactly. It is yeah. pure on the on the nose dialogue. Also, right. another thing, and if I if I may dissect the room here for a second, sure. um, the when you're writing a scene, and I think writers should understand this, is that you really need to pick the most important and interesting part of the scene. Right. So, what a perfect scene is just a wonderful scene in um in the room is this scene that they go into a cafe, and right. The scene starts with two people we have never seen before in our life ordering. I'm going to have a coffee. I'm going to have a guess. Great. Mm-hmm. Two other people should go right behind them in line. Order. We don't know who these people are. Right. The third people are our characters and they <laughs> order. <laughs> so you sat there for a minute and a half watching right. someone else hell? order for yeah. no reason. And that's right. the most interesting part. We would have should have picked it up at. Our characters yeah, yeah. Well, ordering. That happens a lot. Yeah, in scenes, it's like, what do you cut a lot? Because a lot about our brain just wants to set up the scene, right? So the examples I usually give is like, if you're going to show an interview scene, right? Somebody had a job interview. You, you're not going to show the guy driving there or even like even before, like getting ready for his interview, driving, finding parking, getting up on the elevator, checking in with the receptionist, uh, you know, waiting, reading a magazine until he's called to the interview. You're going to cut right at the interview, right? So that's, that's – uh, that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it's you know, and uh, and that scene specifically, you might not even have to ha- have them ordering the coffee. They should just maybe right, just be right. sitting down at the coffee shop with the co- yeah. unless the ordering really is moving the story along. And that's fat that could but be. Find, uh, yeah. So actually, one of the f- the first questions you should ask yourself with with uh, scene writing is what's what's the point of that scene? What's the purpose of that scene? Right. Do you have yeah. any Do you have any tips on how to create good subtext in dialogue? Uh, I do because I show a whole bunch of techniques as well in in uh, in the book on on subtext. Um, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, the ones that come to mind is implying things, uh, right? Or even not even saying a line. Like think about how if the character can actually do something that implies something, as opposed to so it's all about implying things, right? Subtext means the meaning be, behind the text, right? So going back to our examples with your friend, if you say, "Oh, it's you," right? Oh, it's you doesn't say anything, but we know in the context, if we know the way you said, or if we know before that you hate the guy, right? We know that, oh, it's you means I hate you and I don't, I'm not happy to see you, right? right. So that would be an example of subtext. You so, know, implying uh, the line. All right, so something phys- like. Phys- physicalizing the line sometimes. So, so like something like if uh, uh, a, wom- uh, a, a woman or a wife knows that her husband's cheating on him and she hasn't told him yet. And he walks in and he's like, hi, honey. And she's washing the dishes. Right. And she and she's like, oh, I'm doing all right. And the way she's washing the dishes mm-hmm. says everything right. about what that scene's about. Or physicalizing. And then yeah. and then he's starting to pick up on it. And then it's like, and then, right. but but no one's saying, you right. cheated on me. Why? But right. it's all yeah, done exactly. within it's exactly. all done within the scene. Right. That's subtext, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, Oh, there's, yeah, yeah. there's, there's yeah. many ways, but subtext is an art form though. That's not, it, it is, it is. And, uh, in a craft as well, you know, yeah. it, it, it the is to like list a whole bunch of techniques and give you examples of it shows you that it is a technique. So you can, you can definitely, uh, apply that. So yeah, I mean, you script doctor a lot. You also, you also <laughs> consult a lot with screenwriters. What right. is the biggest thing you see? Like, what what do you come in to fix the most? Like, what is the thing that you're like the house the the house you come in to re, to to a, a, analyze the structure of the house right. and the interior design? And what right. is the thing that you see? Like, man, if people would just get this right, it would right. be so much better. It depends. Uh, there's so many so many different things. It depends on the the student, and I also teach at UCLA, so it's kind of like it depends on on where the student's level. So, like I said, sometimes a student can uh, or a client can write great uh, characters and great dialogue, but the scenes are not working or the story's not working. A lot of the times, it's theme. That's the reason why I feel, you know, one of the things that I've come to realize is how important stories are for us humans and why that is, and that's really theme. So if you really know how to write to theme, right, 
because uh, everything connects to it. Like the, 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 the characters and the character arc connects to theme. The dialogue will connect to theme if you have a good thematic argument. Uh, and then, of course, the plot. So uh, so that's the thing. And if theme is a foundational issue. Right? I remember mm-hmm. Rod Serling saying it's where it starts. So you have to know theme. You have to know what you're trying to say. Right. And then figure out your character who's going to convey that and the plot and, you know, um, the ending of it. Now you had one of well, your theme fr- would be the answer. Okay. So yeah. you also you also wrote a book called The 101 Habits of Highly Successful Ri- Screenwriters. Book, yes. Your very first book. Yeah. What are some top habits that <laughs> screenwriters should do to be a good screenwriter? And I'm going to say the first one would probably be just write. But yeah. uh, what's some other ones? That's basically it. <laughs> That's just right. just right. Just man, know, right. There's a, there's 101 habits in there and and all the big big time writers talk about what they do in all those specific habits. So there's a lot to read. Mm-hmm. Um but uh but yeah, pretty much it comes down to uh ass to the chair, right? Like putting your butt on the chair. And dedicating the time. So a, a, a good tip is to schedule the time. You know, like you know, when you have your calendar and you schedule your dentist appointment, uh, you don't miss that, right? So you 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 show up for that, right? So a good te- a good technique is to actually put in writing time in your calendar with this with a start date, a start time, and an end time, so that you get those notifications on the Mac that says you know your meeting starts in 30 minutes, you know, and. Uh, and and so if you actually write down your writing sessions, at least you'll show up and hopefully dedicate yourself to writing. So that's a that's a habit right there. Well, uh, well, how about for screenwriters who I've heard this a thousand times? I only write when I'm inspired. It's when I yes. when I get the inspiration. And th- right, these are the right. same th- these are the yep. same guys who have the screenplay they've been working on for seven years. Right. Exactly. Um, the one screenplay, not the <laughs> the twenty, the one screenplay. The one screen. And every time you talk to them, they're like, "How's that screenplay going? Almost there." Yeah, almost, almost, there. almost yeah. just just a almost, little bit, yeah. almost there. Yeah. Um, so, so what, the answer, and this is actually came from uh, actually who said that to me? Um, I forget now, but one one of the writers in the One One Habits uh, book, mm-hmm. um, who said, uh, you know, does does a plumber have plumber's block? <laughs> I mean, he has to go and he has to fix what he needs to fix. He shows up on time. That's his job. Right. He doesn't have you don't go to your office job and say, oh, I don't feel like it today. Right. You go. You do it because there's a lot at stake. That's that's the problem with writers. They don't have a lot at stake. Right. I mean, because right. nobody's forcing you to write. Right. There's no deadline. There's no put somebody's not putting a gun on your head. So that's another another tip for you guys is to make sure you give yourself stakes, like give yourself deadlines, get yourself uh, like one great trick is uh to tell people that you're going to write, right, that you're going to finish your script by, let's say, three months from now, right? So in uh, February 1st, right? You're gonna, um, and you tell people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish my script February 1st. And if I don't finish my script by February 1st, I'm going to have to donate $1,000, right, to – the NRA or to the Trump campaign or to, uh, you know, Nazi, yeah, not, Nazi, not, yeah, uh, Nazi, not Nazi, not Nazi lovers. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, but yeah. Any, basically anything that you totally abhor, hate, uh, hate and you're going to force yourself. And believe me, if, if somebody's going to hold down, down to it. So actually you're going to have to give the thousand dollars to your friend so that they're going to send it and they will send it. If you don't give them the script by February 1st, and I guarantee you, you will finish your script by February 1st. There's actually there's actually websites dedicated to this. There's one called there Stick. Go. There's one called I think Stick.com, which is like the character oh, the stick. Right. stick. And stick. you do a public. Yeah, yeah. You you put it. You put up uh, your your thing, and it does exactly that. They'll deposit. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you don't if you don't supply it, they will deposit yeah. it directly into the the opposite. There you go. And believe me, and that suddenly now you have stakes. Now you have motivation. You now will. Like, you will. God, work. I really need to finish that. Right. You will write. You will yes. write. <laughs> now it may, it may not be good, but at least you'll finish it. And that's step number one. You have to finish it, and then you can go back to it and fix what's not working. Can can we talk about the rewriting process a little bit? Because that is sure. such a that is such a, a pain in the butt. Oh my god! <laughs> but I also like I found myself when I'm writing a lot of times, and this is old the old versions of me is I would I would rewrite as I write because it was an excuse mm-hmm. to not continue. 
So you have the greatest first chapter or the first, yeah. the greatest first 20 pages ever. Yeah. But you, it's useless because you haven't actually, finished it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you halfway on that one. There's actually okay. could be a good trick. And it's actually Eric Roth, who's the big time screenwriter sure. of Forrest Gump. So Eric Roth's technique, which I think is pretty, pretty effective, is that every day he rewrites from page one. But every day he adds to it. So that so he so let's say the first day he does the first scene, right? It's three pages or ten pages. The next day he's gonna rewrite page ten and continue to page fifteen. The next day he's gonna go page one to page twenty. The next day he's gonna go to but he's always starting from scratch so that by the time yes. the script is done, he's rewritten it like thirty or forty times. Right? So I think that's a really good technique. It takes a little longer, uh, but that's his technique and and you know you can't uh, you can't doubt that one but that's you know? but but that's like samurai level writing like you you're yeah. talking about a master you're talking about yeah. like to be a first time yeah. writer doing that like well, you, who says you cannot be a master right off the gate <laughs> we talking Carl hey, Carl stop it Alex we're talking about <laughs> techniques here we're not talking about <laughs> we're not talking about talent okay talent you're right talent is that thing that you either have it or not or you keep you keep getting feedback or you yeah, have yeah. a good idea good story that's fine. Fine. But we're talking about writing habits here. Anybody okay. can do these habits, right? Anybody you can. can do the deadline. Anybody can do the rewriting trick. If they, There's another but one if that they stick, Seinfeld but, but, is known for, the, the break the chain. Have you heard of that one? No, no, no. I haven't. What's that one? So this was to be Jerry Seinfeld's uh, technique for making sure that he wrote a j jokes every single day. And so what he did is that he had his calendar, and every time he wrote, he would put a big X, right? And then he, the next day, an X, an X, and another X. And his job when he looked at his calendar, was to not break the chain. Like he had, to, he had to make sure he had an X every cent because if he didn't do it one day, he would break the chain. You would see this hole of the chain of Xs. So that's a really great trick. Like you look at that chain, you go, oh my God, look at all those things in a row. I've been so productive. I don't want to break the chain. So you just keep doing it, you know? That's a, very, they're very, very powerful. And the longer that, and the longer that chain is, the less you're gonna likely you are gonna break. You're like, I have my chains going exactly. for five. My, my chain's been going for five years, and it's just like it just keeps there going you go. and going. There you that's go. that's very powerful. The Eric yeah. Roth, the Eric Roth one, I love, and I think it's a wonderful yeah. way of you of could doing do it. that. That's so simple. You because can't. we're not talking about we're not talking about some people rewriting the same chapter one or first scene, right? And never never writing anything new. But that's what write something new. But right? that's the thing. That's the discipline. That's the, that, that's yeah. the discipline that I'm pointing out is like you have to have the discipline to keep going and right. make sure you, you, you. It's that's why I was like I I think it's a little bit more samurai in the sense of the just the discipline yeah. aspect of it. But in right. theory, I think it's a fantastic technique. It's a fantastic yeah. habit. Yeah, um, I'm an optimist. Everybody can be a samurai <laughs> if they if they apply and, yeah. and practice. <laughs> I I agree. I agree. Maybe Watch I'm a, a, a chair. Maybe maybe I'm a little too cynical. Maybe I just I got too I got too much shrapnel. I got too much shrapnel in me. You my friend. Burbank. That's, I, that's right. I'm in the <laughs> midst of this. I'm still. You're away from Hollywood right now. Like oh, I'm in it. I still. I'm very cynical. Uh, I just seen too much. Yeah, I'm but breathing I, some fresh air. Yes. Yes, exactly. The you are. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, the, the stench of broken dreams are out here, sir. And I can't. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> but but we're here to help. But we're here to help. And that's why I do the show. I want filmmakers to understand the realities of what the business is, but yet to continue to follow that dream. Because yes. if we don't, what is the reason why we're here? I mean, if not, we could all be accountants somewhere making money, or we could all be a lawyer somewhere doing stuff. We're here. We're crazy. We have to understand we're all nuts just for even being here. This That's is a true. crazy yeah. business. Absolutely. And, and to try to make money in this business is even more insane. We're carnies. We're carnival folk, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> essentially. <Yeah. laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, sir. Sure. What okay. are three? What are the three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on genre. Why, yeah, well, not not just genre, but why would you read? Like, if you say, if, if you like, for example, for me, like, if you had a, a problem with dialogue, I would tell you which dialogue scripts to, to read. You know, like I would say, go read the Tarantino script or uh, you know Aaron Sorkin or David Mamet, right? Or if it was for description specifically, like I would say, read a Tony Gilroy or read a Shane Black script, Shane Black, right? Yeah. I mean, so that's so very very specific. You have uh, craft elements that some scripts are better than others, but overall. For overall great storytelling, I would say read any any Pixar script if you can get your hands on it. Um, 
But but you know, I would go for my favorite uh, filmmakers like you know uh, Billy Wilder. So to read oh, read some so like it hot, read The Apartment, which is one of my favorite movies of all oh. time. Uh, Blade Runner, uh, you know, uh, Inception. I mean, it's all you know. I can just name all my favorite movies and say, go read that script. You know. Now, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Write a great script. I know you probably heard this a million times, but it just, really. I, I'm right. telling you, I mean, so many people are so worried about the marketing and the networking, pitching. And the, pitching and all this thing and yeah. they don't realize all they need is just one great script. I'm not saying only write one script. I'm saying just write a great script because you can literally drop it anywhere or anybody you meet by accident, even if it's the accountant or, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. One of my, my clients uh, recently, um, they're writing a script and uh, they're writing it for a specific actor in mind and they've been, they've been working on it for a very long time. And out of the blue, uh, he's a tennis player <clears throat> and he tells me that out of the blue that one of his tennis partners that he plays on a regular basis is the head of accounting for Netflix. And I'm going, okay, dude, because all this time he's been waiting to send it to the actor's, uh, production company. Right. And I say, dude, just make sure you write, you finish to make sure it's a great script. Right. And then give it to the accounting guy at Netflix. Because I guarantee you that if he loves that script, he's going to give it to the right people at Netflix, who then will show it to that actor, and the actor will say yes to Netflix and not to these two unknown writers, right? So that's that was great. my advice to them. But that's the thing. So write a great script, and you can show it to the. You know, in my in my one on one habits book, I, I heard so many stories of how these writers broke in, and and a lot of them were I gave it to I wrote this great script and I gave it to the secretary of this of the friend of a friend of a friend of whatever. And you hear so much of these stories of just somebody. I, I mean, think about it. If you saw a great movie, right? Wouldn't you die to tell your friends about it, right? And it's exactly that. Somebody reads a great script, no matter who it is. They're gonna they're gonna chances are, and especially if you're in LA, chances are they they know somebody in the industry. It says, hey, I read this great script. Could you want to read it? Of course. You know, it's all about word of mouth. You know, and, and it was so, yeah, it was it's, it was how Tarantino got in because Tarantino was trying to knock on doors for for years, right. I mean, ten years, and right. finally someone said someone read it, like I think it was uh, Natural Born Killers, I think it was or True Romance, yeah. and yeah. and it handed it to somebody, handed it to somebody, right, right. And exactly, it, and he got yeah. it, right. So I mean, uh, you know, uh, Michael Arndt wrote, uh, ended up being hired by Pixar strictly on the strength of Little Miss Sunshine, who, when they read the script and hired him, was before the movie came out. So strictly on the on the strength of the script, they he got hired. So that's that's why I keep saying, write a great script. Learn, take the time to learn the craft. Take the time to write and rewrite as many times as it takes to write a great script. And when you finally have a great script. Then you can go ahead and try to network and try to tell people about it or enter it in, in a reputable contest like Austin or the Nickel and just just have a great product because right now people are just jumping the gun. They're just trying to make uh, connections and 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 uh, you know uh, uh, friendships and relationships within the business, right? Which is important. But the first thing they care about is if you tell them you're a screenwriter, the first thing I'm going to say is, okay, tell me about the script you wrote. Tell me about your best script. Because that's all they want to know. They want to read a great script. Everybody's looking for a great script in this town. Nobody has a job in this town without a great script, right? No, actors have nothing to say. Directors have nothing to direct. Agents, I mean, think about all the, the, the crew, production. I mean, there's like thousands. The entire town runs on a script. you got to have a script. And that's why it's such – I mean, it's the, to me, it's the best profession, right? Because it starts with you, the writer, right? You write a great script and everything will go from there. But if you don't have that great script, if you're, if you're like, you know, you're trying to market without or you're trying to sell a script that's not ready, you're just wasting your time because, you know, let's, let's, say, let's say you have a great idea for a script, right? And you tell an executive that you just ran into somebody at a lunch place, right? And you say, hey, I wrote the script and it's about, let's say they pitch him like Blade Runner or something, right? And let's say Blade Runner was never made. It's kind of like that movie yesterday with the, the Beatles. Oh, so guy, right? good. I love that right? movie. Exactly. Love that movie. Right? So imagine you were a screenplay, a screenwriter, 
in an age where nobody knew all the great movies that were ever made, Chinatown, The Godfather, right? All this stuff, right? It's and they say, concept. you're the writer. You'll be the hottest writer in the world, right? right. Yeah, that's probably an idea for a movie. Right? Right. Okay, never mind. So imagine you're that. Let's say you pitch a great idea, right? And the executive says, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Can I read the script? Yeah. Okay, you send them the script. The script is not, is not good, not ready. The, the idea is good. The script is not ready. Their reader is going to read it. They're going to do coverage on it, pass. That's it. You're done. And chances are you run, you run into this other, uh, that same executives again with a second script or with a, or even a better version of your script. And believe me, you already, you, you got a bad taste in his mind, right, uh, about that. So they're not going to be that uh, enthusiastic to, to read your script again or to read another script of yours. So don't break, you know, you only have one chance to impress. And so make sure you have a solid script. Make sure you learn the craft, take the time, take the classes, uh, read the books, whatever it is. There's so much free information out there right now, mm -hmm. I, especially on your site, right? right? Kudos to you for that. Uh, and there's other uh, big time um, uh, websites that have a lot of free information, like going to the story uh, with my uh, yeah, ex it's got, ELA, right? Yeah. Uh, it's got my so, yeah. uh, Exactly. Um, and so... You know, and then get get uh, you know get coverage if you want to see how your script is doing if it's ready, right? There's a lot of uh, reading services uh, like yours, but for you know less than a hundred dollars, you can get uh, mm -hmm. a reader to say if your script is good or not, and you and then you don't lose that important first impression from a real executive, right? Uh, so get that out of the way or send it to a to a, a contest to see. You know, except the contest take longer to get feedback back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Readers, I think the reading service is a good way to start. And then if, you know, you may, the reader will just tell you what's not working. They say, okay, it's not working. And they may tell you why, but a lot of them, they, they don't tell you. And that's when you go to a consultant because the consultant will be able to kind of like go deeper and analyze why something is not working and tell you how to fix it, right? So I consult as well. And, and it really depends on the, the consultant's knowledge of the craft, right? So the more they know about the craft, the, know, the more they know what works in a script and doesn't, they'll be able to help you. So that's what I would suggest. But take the time to write a great script. That's probably the biggest mistake I see writers make, that they, they just mark it too soon, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the... All right. Yeah. And where can people find out about you and your work? Uh, just uh, go to my website, carliglacius.com. Uh, uh, my books are The One-on-One -on -one Habit of Highly Successful Screenwriters and the big one, The Writing for Emotional Impact, which is all the techniques that I talk about to create that emotional engagement in the audience. So I feel that that is probably the key to the craft. Uh, that's also available on Amazon and on my website and everywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can get all the information from my website, so carlguysis.com. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have some of your courses on uh, Indie Film Hustle TV as well. That's right. uh, yeah. So we'll be able, and they're great. And I saw, I before I ever had the pleasure of meeting you, sir, I was taking that that oh, DVD okay. course and thank reading you. that book. So thank you so much, Carl, for all the work you've been doing to help the screenwriters oh, out here, man. Pleasure. I, was, I was love to talk about the craft and uh, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Carl, again for coming back on the show and dropping the knowledge bombs on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe. I truly, truly appreciate it, my friend. And I've partnered with Carl to bring you his screenwriting masterclass series on Indie Film Hustle TV, which includes how to craft dialogue, how to create themes, how to dig into plot, how to use some of the best habits that the biggest screenwriters in the world have, and much, much more. And you can check all that out at IndieFilmHustle.tv. And if you want to get links to anything else Carl has to offer, his consulting, his other high-end courses, his books, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS061. Thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. I truly appreciate it. If you haven't, please leave a review for the show. Head over to screenwritingpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really, really helps us out a lot. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. Get a whole new perspective on Ram 1500 and Ram Heavy Duty. Motor Trend's back-to-back -back truck of the year at the Ram Start Something New sales event. 
well-qualified lessees of competitive vehicles get a low mileage lease on the 2020 Ram 1500 Bighorn Quad Cab 4x4 with a V6 engine for $229 a month for 42 months with $4,079 due at signing. Tax, title, license, extra. Call 1-877-RAM-5722 for details. Requires dealer contribution to lease through U.S. Bank. Extra charge for miles over $35,000. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 2-3-2020.